Welcome, everybody. I am Jesse Mogul, and thank you for joining us on the American Contingency Podcast. We are a united nationwide community of steadfast Americans ready for any challenge that comes our way. We inform, equip, and train so you can prepare, respond, and recover from any man-made or natural disaster or situation. And it is, once again, thrilling to have you here for about another 30 minutes of awesome American Contingency time. We're finishing up a year. I almost said it was a great year, almost said it was a bad year. That's all subjective to your perspective. What kind of year it's been for you is really how you are creating your reality in your own mind. How are you seeing what's going on in the world and then internalizing that? And I think that's what we are going to cover today in this podcast. Because we're finishing up 2023, here comes 2024. And in my other life, my other podcasts in my life and and recovery and business coaching that I do, I teach my clients and my listeners to create this 60-day window where one year begins to start and one year has an opportunity to ramp down. And in the metaphor example that I use, picture one of those four by 100 races that you see in the Olympics, where there is a zone where the runner with the baton has the opportunity to slow down while the runner waiting for the baton has an opportunity to speed up. And when they're met at just the right moment, they perfectly pass the baton in order for the runner getting the baton to be able to reach maximum velocity as quickly as possible. That's how I like to picture one year ending and one year beginning. So on December 1st is when your 2024 will see 2023 coming closer to it and begin to ramp up as your 2023 is naturally beginning to wind down. In the United States, it works out perfectly because we decided to stack all of our important holidays right at the end of the year. Halloween is a signifier that Thanksgiving and Christmas are on their way. Thanksgiving is really when people say, okay, now it's the holiday season, and you'll notice a drop-off in work productivity, a more uh, family and holiday-centric and focused society moving forward until after New Year's and about a week after that. And people generally say, okay, well, now it's time to get my 2024 ramped up. Uh, People put a tremendous amount of pressure on January 1st as if that day is going to magically be the day that they begin to eat healthier and lose weight and drink less and love more. And it's just too much pressure to put on one single day. And it's why I came up with this strategy, because I just I just don't think that New Year's resolutions generally work. Um, studies have actually been conducted that show it's like a 90% fail rate on that or a 10% success rate, depending on how you would like to look at it. But either way, not very good. And we want to be able to increase our chances at shifting the areas of our lives that are no longer working for us, that are no longer benefiting us, and that we can start to actually make changes so that this time next year in 2024, we have accomplished so many things that we set out and told ourselves we wanted to accomplish um, at the end of 2023 in 2024. So starting December 1st is whenever you begin to start thinking, and hopefully you've been thinking, but for a majority of people, they don't really put a lot of thought into the next year until it gets closer to it. For me, I've been thinking about 2024 for months now. Um, in fact, I started getting my master's so I could become a therapist about three or four months ago. I'm already projecting certain parts of my life into 20, 2026, 2027, and 2028. And I had to establish this very five-year long-term plan and break certain things down in order to achieve it. When we were younger and people would ask us what we wanted to be when we grew up or what we what our five or 10-year plan was... Um, It becomes very difficult to do that because when we go to visualize who we are five years down the road or 10 years down the road, in our minds, we generally are picturing the way we look now, but we know we won't look the way we look now then. So there becomes this disengagement, a disconnection in what we're trying to visualize versus what we actually think we can accomplish because our brain knows that we're not going to look the same five years down the road that we do now. So then we start trying to visualize the things that we want to accomplish. uh, It becomes more difficult. So my way around that is to look less inside my mind and more down on paper. 
what is it that I've actually taken out of my mind and put down on paper, or you're typing it out on a keyboard, however you decide you want to take this information out of your head and make it tangible. You've got to get it out of your head and down on paper, on a computer screen, something that makes it more tangible. Otherwise, it just is more noise inside your head. And not just in America, but we as humans, we have that voice in our head that never shuts up. And if all we're doing is thinking about what we want to do and we're not actually writing it down or typing it out, then it just becomes part of the general noise, confusion, overwhelm that's going on inside of our heads at all times. Um, This is the same thing I coach people to do when they're just trying to figure out what they're going to do tomorrow is to get it out on paper. And when you do this, you have a tremendous, I would say, resiliency and fortitude to actually accomplish it because it becomes real. It's out of your head and it's actually in the real world where it can be seen. You can touch the paper. You can touch the keyboard keys. uh, You can talk it out loud to yourself with other people around you and you can actually begin to move forward on these things. So December 1st is when we start to think about and and ramp up 2024. February 1st is whenever um, the baton is, the baton gets passed January 1st, but it's that last 30 days of I would say my version of 2023, which is January 1st to February 1st, or for some people, the beginning of the year starts then. But you give yourself 2023 the opportunity to begin to slow down. By February 1st, you can completely say 2023 is closed and it's in the books. And this works perfectly with the track metaphor, because when you notice the runner with the baton, hand it to the new runner without the baton, that runner who had the baton doesn't just stop on a dime. There's a slowing down process that takes place. So when you utilize this metaphor, you can actually visualize how you have a 60-day window to wrap up your year. And that's what we're going to discuss today, is what you could be doing over the next 60 days in order to really create a magnificent 2024 for yourself and really feel closure with 2023. And we're going to start by discussing um, deeper versions of questions, um, how we can empower ourselves, how we can take responsibility for ourselves, and how we can release victim mentality. And in conclusion, we're going to close up this show with some conversational topics around emotional and psychological resiliency. Because we as Americans have an amazing, almost innate ability to forge through the difficult. But it's when we are on a mission that we best accomplish this. Left to our own devices without much to focus upon, we tend to internalize too much. We tend to attack one another. But when we have a reason to galvanize around something, Pearl Harbor's anniversary is coming up soon. We galvanized around our country being attacked while our sailors slept. We turned our entire country into a war machine, and we went off and kicked some Nazi ass. When 9-11 went down, we felt you know, de- demoralized that this would happen to us, that they would crumble these two majestic buildings in the heartbeat of our country, yet we all of us got together and said, that's it. Now it's time to stand strong and unite with one another. We went over to the Middle East and, you know, started wars like we do. But here in this country, I mean, it was amazing how much love was shown to one another. Um, I would say not just for those first few months, but for probably about a year. And then slowly but surely, it just weaned away. And now it's a distant memory, but I know where I was at whenever the towers fell. And anybody who is alive and and old enough to be cognizant of what's going on around them, meaning, you know, no three-year-old is going to remember where they were when the towers fell. But certainly anybody who is self-aware, even at age five, six, seven, eight, would have known where they were. And it was amazing to see the country get together and love one another. And that's what we're going to start working towards in 2024 so we stop destroying ourselves from within. So let's get to this. All right, first thing I want to talk about is the question beneath the question. Are we asking ourselves deeper, more meaningful questions? I want to encourage you to reflect on the kinds of questions that you're asking yourself so that you can uncover deeper insights. So when you say that you're worried about the economy, right, how can I become more financially stable? That's a question a lot of people are asking. But the 
underlying question to that really is about your human need for security and certainty or your competency managing your finances. If your answer to how can I be more financially stable is, well, whenever a different politician gets in office, you are taking on the disempowering dynamic. You are saying, well, if something externally happens, then I can internally fix something else. I, if this person does that, then I can have this. That's disempowering. That's a victim mindset. If we're always waiting for somebody else to do something in order for us to achieve something else, then we are not in control of our lives. We are the subject of our lives, or we're the object of our lives rather than the subject. Are you the leading character in your movie, or are you just sitting in the passenger seat waiting for the leading character to steer your you know, car movie of life into the direction you want it to go? If you want your spouse or your loved ones to pay more attention to you, to care more about what it is you're saying, or in the question becomes, how can I get my partner to listen to me or spend more time with me? Now you're asking of what your partner can do in order for you to have the feelings of having more time spent with you. I encourage my clients and I encourage the listeners of my other podcasts to ask the question in such a way that they become the action taker. What can I do? Or Yes, what can I do in order to elicit from my partner the desire to spend more time with me, to pay more attention to me? Then you are in the driver's seat. It puts you in action mode. Now, whether what you do ultimately brings your desire to fruition, yes, that is the unknown variable. But if you're sitting there waiting for your partner to magically just decide to spend more time with you or listen to you or care more about what you have to say, you could be waiting a long time. But if you begin to have conversations with them or shift your behaviors, then there is an opportunity for you to be in control of that. This works along anything that you might be worried about. I know a lot of our members get worried about social justice issues or crime or impending wars that our country might go to or the wars that are happening in Ukraine or the Gaza Strip. And yes, a lot of those things, those are out of our control. But how do we internalize what's happening? And if you want to feel more stable, regardless of the fact that there are wars happening around the world, the question becomes, what can I do right now in my life to feel more stable, regardless of the fact that there are wars happening all around the world? There are always wars happening all around the world. We are a country that I believe I once read is like out of our 250 some years of existence, we've only not been in war for I think like 20 or 30 years. We are pretty consistently having at the very least a skirmish with someone, let alone a full on war. So that is our default as humans to be in conflict, not to be in peace. So figuring out a way to stabilize yourself, regardless of what's happening externally, is of the utmost importance. And American contingency is all about self-awareness and personal resolve. So asking yourself questions beneath the question, instead of it just being the easy one, you know, how can I be more financially stable? You know, how can I save more money in 2024? It could be, you know, what is it I can do in order to bring more money in? so I can create stability in my life. And that might be a side hustle. That might be looking for a different job. That might be asking your boss for a raise or seeking um, overtime pay. It can be a lot. And that's all subjective to your own perspective. And of course, I could come up with a million hypotheticals, but maybe none of those land with you. But you know your situation way better than I ever could, considering there's thousands of you and I'm just sitting over here with a microphone in front of me. So look for the question beneath the question right? It's again, it's like this iceberg where a bulk of the mass is always going to be underneath the surface. We generally ask very shallow questions. When we ask ourselves deeper questions, how can I be more prepared for the next uh, mother nature catastrophe coming the way? The, The deeper question is, what is it I'm seeking? Am I seeking safety and security? Am I seeking variety and knowing all the different ways to get out of my community? If I need to evacuate, what is it that you're actually desiring beneath the surface? Figure out the question in order to find that answer. That moves us into the empowerment versus disempowerment dynamic, which I have mentioned. The empowerment dynamic is the one where we are the creator of our lives. We seek coaches or mentors and people uh, who can guide us 
towards a more fulfilling life or, or be able to provide us answers to questions that we're looking for. And then there's the challenger, and that's just the world around us. The disempowering dynamic is one where there's a victim, there's a villain, and there's a hero. And generally, people put themselves in the victim or hero seat. Uh, most people don't want to admit that they are villains at times, but majority of people will put themselves in the victim seat and they'll say, well, if this politician gets into office, then my finances will be saved. If this politician gets into office, then we won't go to war. Or if this politician gets into office, then social justice issues will be dealt with and crime will go down. But now we're expecting this person out there to be our hero. And if there's one thing we can generally agree on when it comes to politicians is they disappoint and fail us way more often than they actually elicit confidence and do the things that they say they're going to do. I don't care what party you're in. If you're being completely honest, you can see the fallibility in your donkey or your elephant just as much as you can see the fallibility in the opposite party that you don't follow or believe in. We cannot be waiting for someone to save our asses. Mike Glover started American Contingency because of what went down in Portland when people were looking for heroes and there weren't any willing to come into their neighborhoods and help them. Let me reel that back. I am sure there was some first responders and some people who were willing, but they were being told to stand down. And these citizens were being left to fend for themselves against a lot of um, social unrest that they were not prepared to handle, deal with, or figure out for themselves. American contingency gets launched with this idea that we need to be our own first responders. We need to be our own heroes. And in the empowerment dynamic, we are our creators, that we can call upon our members who have more experience with you know, planning how to have provisions set aside if a catastrophe goes down. We can call upon our members to help us, you know, figure out how to utilize uh, firearms and weaponry in order to protect ourselves. Those become our coaches, our mentors, our guiders, but we're not looking for them to be our hero. And the world is not a villain. A majority of people do not wake up each day looking for ways to ruin your life. They are living their lives you are living your life, and there might be some conflict, and it might create a sort of consternation between the two of you, but nobody who's waking up generally, I'm not going to say no one, it's a huge world, saying, how can I destroy Jesse's life today? They're going to do what they do, and it might conflict with what I want to do, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing what they're doing just to destroy me. That's the victim-villain hero dynamic, and I don't play in that world. They might challenge me to come up with a different situation, come up with a different scenario and, and, or a different answer, but they're not sitting here trying to destroy me. They are doing what they believe they want to do for themselves or for their followers, right? This goes to that whole Republican-Democrat dynamic. A majority of those politicians aren't setting out to destroy a Democrat or destroy a Republican. They have their morals, ethics, values, opinions, beliefs, principles, and standards, and they want to adhere to those. Their followers also want to adhere to those. And then the other party has their own morals, ethics, values, opinions, beliefs, principles, and standards, and they want to adhere to those. Are they going to conflict? Well, that's obvious because they are conflicting, but they don't need to conflict. That's just the choice that these politicians have made in order to keep us separated and at each other's throats. Again, a nation galvanized is not a nation that anybody wants to deal with. You galvanize a U.S. citizen, an American, you get us all together in a group, we'll take over the world. So as long as they keep us at each other's throats, then we're not united. Keeping us from becoming united is what keeps them being able to just do whatever the hell they want to do. It keeps them in power. Be in the empowerment dynamic. Stop looking for somebody else to be your hero. You be your creator. And this is going to go right into taking responsibility versus the blame game. When we take responsibility, we become the cornerstone of empowerment. It's owning your decisions, the, good, the outcomes, the good and the bad. Blaming others is a sign of disempowerment. Right? It's, a, it's akin to giving the reins of your you know, horse and carriage over to somebody else and saying, okay, you drive it, and then getting pissed off at them whenever they put you into a ditch. 
we want to shift the locus of, of our control to external opportunities, right? This is going to shift our psychological resiliency and our emotional resiliency. We want to take responsibility. That is one of the first things I learned in addiction recovery. Take responsibility for my actions. If I voted for this particular politician and they went off and did that stuff, I can take responsibility for the fact that I voted for them. But I don't take responsibility for their actions and behaviors. Those are theirs. They are doing those things. This politician did make a promise to me, and they're not following through on that promise, and that sucks. But I am not the one controlling their brain. I am not controlling their hands. This isn't ratatouille. I'm not over there making these politicians do anything. People can make promise to us. To a, People can make, let me slow it down, because this could, this, maybe my tongue's getting tied because this is important. Politicians will make promises to us, and we will believe them. We will hope that what they say they're going to do is what they do. And then they get into office, and they run headlong into um, other party members, people who don't want to see them succeed, people who don't want them to get credit for improving things, and they begin to sabotage them. And whether we ever know that saboteur is doing what they're doing is, you know, that's subjective to a timeline. We don't know. But we do know that we hoped this person would do what they were going to do. And then we turn around two, three, four years later and realize they haven't done any of it. So then what is it that we can do in our lives to make what they're doing less of an impact? They're still going to pass laws on taxes. They're going to raise interest rates, right? They're going to basically just open up an airplane over the country and shove hundreds of millions of dollars out into the wind. And then everybody just gets to pick it up. And then we get to deal with inflation and a recession a few years later. Yes, that stuff happened, but we're here standing on the side of the road and screaming at the tire because it's flat doesn't fix the flat tire. Take responsibility, get out the instruments that will fix the tire, fix the tire and get on with life. There's a difference and we can move right into victim mentality versus victor mentality. When you have a victim mentality, you're just sitting in the passenger seat. You're screaming at the tire. You're blaming a politician in DC or your state house. You're just along for the ride, but you're not in charge of your direction. I want us to all have a victor mentality going into 2024, right? I want you to be firmly in your driver's seat. You navigate through the daily obstacles with your own agency, your own determination. It's the difference between seeing life's challenges as insurmountable walls or as simple speed bumps in life. You have an opportunity to ask yourself deeper questions, to step into the empowerment dynamic, to take responsibility for your decisions and the results that that they provide, and to have a victor mentality over a victim mentality. And we can do this by daily thinking about what it is that we can... Okay, let me reel this in. There's emotional resiliency and there's psychological resiliency. When we think about emotional resiliency... One of the coolest things about this is that we have opportunities on a day-to-day basis to work on our emotions. So what is emotional resiliency? All right, it's this opportunity to realize that you can handle the ebbs and the flows. It's the ability to adapt to a stressful situation or crisis, which is literally the hallmark of American contingency. Can we prepare you to respond and recover to a natural disaster, to a Uh, mother nature to uh, a train being derailed in Ohio and spilling tons of chemicals into the river, right? Can we guide you and aid you in your ability to adapt to stressful situations or crises? It's having that mental reservoir of strength that you can call upon during times of need to carry you through difficult times. Right? When we think about this under societal pressures, whether it be economic turndowns, political unrest, social upheaval, emotional resiliency acts as this buffer. It can protect our mental well-being. So there are absolutely going to be ways for you to be able to start to achieve this within yourself. We can think of mindfulness. We can think of self-care routines, emotional regulation opportunities, because we want you to be the willow and the wind. Have you ever seen one of those weeping willows uh, way off in like 
when I go travel and I drive a lot, and uh, I used to hear people call the middle of our country flyover states. I call them drive-through states because you only understand the majestic beauty of our heartland when you drive through it. Otherwise, everything just looks like a forest in a field. You've got to drive through these states. And when I drive through states, I inevitably will see like a weeping willow, a gigantic tree in this field. Right? That willow has stood for tens, if not hundreds of years without breaking, regardless of the strong winds. That's your emotional resiliency. I want you to be able to sway with the challenges rather than snapping under the pressure. Another beautiful metaphor around this would be water in a stream adapting to the obstacles in front of it. It's going downstream regardless of whether there is a log or a rock in its way. If it has to overflow its banks in order to get around the, uh, the dam that's in its way, it will. Water doesn't care. It will always move forward. That's what I want you to be able to do for yourself. I want you to be able to move forward. So when we start thinking about emotional resiliency, there's seven different things I came up with, and I'm going to get these out. And I'm not going to try to go too in-depth because these will be podcast, I'm sorry, uh, well, yeah, future podcast, but essentially blogging topics for January. So if you're not a member of American Contingency yet, you can go to AmericanContingency.com, sign up for a membership. Seriously, y'all, it's like the price of a cup of coffee or less than a value meal at a fast food restaurant every single month in order to be a part of this amazing network that we have created where there are people out there who can be your coaches. They can be the guidance that you seek. And maybe you are the coach. Maybe you are somebody who can bring guidance and you want to be able to share your information and you can do that at AmericanContingency.com. So emotional resiliency. I want you to cultivate a positive outlook. Maintain hope and an optimistic perspective. And I get, I do, It can be difficult at times when the world around us seems like it's a gigantic, chaotic cluster fireball. I almost use profanity, Um, right? I get it. But whether it's practicing gratitude by regularly reflecting on the things that you do have, and that's one of the key things I teach my clients. If you have a hard time figuring out what you're grateful for, you know, and being grateful for the things that you do have. Look around at the things that if you didn't have them, you would spend the rest of your day, weeks, or months trying to get it back. It's like your phone. You don't want to be grateful for your phone. Leave it at home and see how much you want that back. I get it. I get it. We all like to unplug sometimes and go out into the woods and, you know, and hug trees. But in general, if, you know, I were to lose my phone, if I were to lose my laptop, I'm trying to look around and think of things. My glasses. If I were to lose these things, I would spend a lot of time and money and resources in order to get those back. So if you're looking for things that you're grateful for, it's the things you already have. I have a favorite pair of shoes that make my feet feel really good whenever I go walking. I would be very disappointed and sad if I lost those shoes, and I would spend a lot of time trying to get those shoes back. I can be grateful for those shoes because I know that if I lost them, I would spend a lot of time getting them back. I would want them back in my life. Right? This can shift your focus from challenges um, around opportunities from scarcity to abundance. Number two, you can build strong social connections. I want you to be fostering supportive relationships with friends and family. And if you are already a member of American Contingency, continue being involved in your local chapter. Get involved in your state chapter. Figure out what's going on regionally. Social support provides a buffer against stress. It's a huge component in developing resiliency. Creating a network where you can give and receive, right, where you can have significance and contribution. I also want us number three, working on our problem solving skills. Critical thinking is extremely important. And I get that the phone is taking away some of the need for that because we can just seemingly ask Google anything. Um, We can just put any math equation into a calculator and figure out what 63 times seven is. But it really helps to start using our brain to fire ourselves off and actually figure things out on our own. Develop your problem solving skills. Number four, practice mindfulness. Whether this is just deep breathing or yoga, and I know I got I got a lot of country dudes up in this podcast, but I'm telling you right now, man, I live in Huntsville, Alabama. I have been to some yoga studios. I see good old boys, good old boys up in there doing some yoga. I'm telling you, bring some joy. 
<laughs> brings them joy. You'd be amazed how good the body feels when you breathe deep and you do some stretching. I know it may not be something that you generally think is an, a, an avenue to help you, but I'm telling you that we're, we're not living in you know, 1982 anymore where everybody who does that stuff is wearing spandex and dancing around uh, to Jane Fonda videos, right? This is a new world we live in where we can utilize the information that is around and being presented to us in order to achieve a more calm and peaceful mind. I know a lot of friends here in Huntsville who love to go hunting, and I cannot even begin to tell you how calming and soothing they talk about going out into the woods and sitting in a deer blind uh, or one of those deer stands or in a duck blind, uh, how relaxing that is for them. It reduces anxiety and it fosters a calming state of mind. So if you can't get out into the woods, you could go do some yoga. And you can do that stuff at home with a YouTube video. Embrace change as a part of life is number five. Changes are going to happen. Whether you are willing to accept them or not is completely up to you. Flexibility is key. Learn to pivot and redirect whenever new challenges arise. Do not be a victim. Be a creator. Number six, nurture a sense of purpose. Humans need purpose. If you look back at your 2023 and think, man, it just feels like it was a cluster mess of hot nonsense, then seek out purpose in 2024. Engage in activities that are meaningful to you, that bring value to your life. It could be your career. It could be your relationships. Maybe you're a parent or you're you're in a partnership. And it could be yourself. Decide you're going to lose a pound a month. Decide you're going to eat more broccoli than McDonald's. Figure out ways to increase your sense of purpose by doing things that are meaningful to you. And number seven, you got to take care of your physical health. If all hell breaks loose and you're huffing and puffing trying to walk up a hill, the zombies are going to get you. Okay, so that's what we got for emotional resiliency. I want you to cultivate a positive outlook. I want you to build strong social connections, develop problem-solving skills, practice mindfulness, embrace change as a part of life, nurture a sense of purpose, and then take care of yourself physically. And we're going to close this up with some ideas around psychological resiliency. And this is your ability to actually create a more um, strong, strident um, mental fortitude. This is important because your ability to adapt to stressful situations and crises with your emotional resiliency is going to be just as important as what it is you can mentally handle. It's the mental processes and behaviors that promote your growth, your personal assets, and protect you and your potential uh, stressors and negative side effects to all that's going on around you in the world. In essence, Mental fortitude is working on your mind that allows you to rebound from adversity. It's a much broader sense than emotional resilience because emotions are in the moment. How are you handling in the moment emotions? Psychological resiliency starts asking of ourselves, how can we begin to create a life that really means something long term? Emotional resiliency is in the moment. Psychological resiliency is something that we begin to foster so that weeks and months and years go by and we are unfazed by things. I see this in the military a lot because they put um, our men and women going through boot camp through a lot in order to increase emotional and psychological resiliency. So in the moment when stressors are firing all at them, they're able to stay calm and do what they need to do in order to complete the mission. And the psychological resiliency is what they have when they come back from the missions and they're still able to compartmentalize it. And hopefully, and and sadly, I am a mental health provider, so I do understand PTSD afflicts way more people than we even realize. Uh, When we start to work on our psychological Psychological resiliency, it doesn't negate the opportunity for the mind to experience PTSD, but it does allow us to be able to develop techniques that can move us through the PTSD and into the healing. So I've come up with seven of these, right? I want you to develop self awareness, number one. Understand that your thoughts and your emotions and your behaviors, these are crucial to your life. Self awareness allows you to recognize patterns in your life, identify triggers and make conscious adjustments to, rep- to improve your responses to stress. In the military, they call them after-action reports, and I have my clients do these. After we're done, you know, having a tough conversation with our spouse, or talking to the boss, or doing a particular activity, do the after-action report. What were your thoughts and feelings going in? What were your thoughts and feelings as it was happening? And what are your thoughts and feelings now that you've 
completed this? What were the actions you took? And what were the results you got? That's self-awareness, right? That's what we seek. It's this idea of having situational awareness starts internally. Number two, I want you to practice self-compassion. Be kind and understanding to yourself in moments of failure or pain. Self-compassion involves treating yourself with the same empathy and kindness that you would offer to a good friend or to a child. Practicing self-compassion allows you to realize that if you didn't do something to the best of your abilities right now, that there will be another opportunity to do it again later. Do an after-action report, figure out what you'd like to modify, and the next time a similar opportunity arises, do those things that you found out about yourself in the after-action report. It's like that. Number three, set realistic goals and expectations. I want you to establish achievable goals and maintain realistic expectations about outcomes. Most people, they doubt how much they can accomplish in five years, and then they way over assume that how much they can accomplish in one year. Set achievable goals, realistic expectations. This can help prevent feelings of inadequacy, and they can reinforce a sense of accomplishment in your life. This is vital for mental resiliency. Look, it's like planting new grass and expecting it to just root and, and grow and prosper in a week. It takes time to nurture it and water it and to, and to cultivate it in order for it to become this beautiful grass. Or for a farmer who plants seeds in spring and expects that there will be a bountiful harvest in two weeks. That's not a realistic goal or expectation. Be mindful of the appropriate amount of time it's going to take for something to actually be achievable. And then set out daily goals in order to achieve that long-term, big, fat, hairy, audacious goal. Number four, embrace learning. Embrace a growth mindset. Challenges are just opportunities for learning. They are not insurmountable obstacles. The water is going to get down the river. It's just going to. Be the water. A growth mindset means that you realize that your abilities are not fixed, that whoever you are today is not who you have to be tomorrow. If you don't know how to fix a spare, uh, a spare tire on your car, if you don't know how to start a fire in the rain, you can learn those skills. That's a growth mindset. To say, oh, I didn't learn how to start a fire in the rain when I was seven, so I guess I just never get to learn it. One, that's ridiculous. Um, two, that's completely ignoring YouTube. And three, that is just... That is just ridiculous. Let me just go back to that. <laughs> no five-year-old knew how to, you know, uh, break down, clean, and rebuild a firearm. But yet, there are many people who go off into the military and learn how to take apart their weapons and put them back together very quickly in order to make sure that it's going to operate effectively in a time of that weapon needing to be utilized. They didn't know how to do that when they were five. They didn't even know how to do that at the beginning of boot camp, more than likely, but they learned it. That's a growth mindset. What's really interesting is that we are constantly learning new things and not even realizing it. So then whenever something that's difficult comes about that we need to learn, we don't realize that we've already learned how to do all these much simpler things. And then we can just take that empowerment that came from learning to tie our shoes or how to load the dishwasher effectively so all the dishes get cleaned. And now we can move it over to here to remodeling um, the spare bedroom or taking apart our engine and fixing something that's expensive if we try to have somebody else do it. We have the ability to shift and change. We just need to recognize it within ourselves. Number five, I want you to enhance your communication skills. I talked about this in the last podcast. Go back and listen to it. Effective communication helps manage and navigate stressful interactions. It's about expressing your needs clearly and concisely. And also about listening actively. Right? This prevents misunderstandings. It reduces potential conflicts. A couple of my favorite sentences are, so in summary, what I think I heard, let me see if, I, let, let me see if I'm getting this right. To make sure that I repeat, I reflect and summarize and repeat what somebody has said to me. So I know that what they said is what I heard. And if they decide to roll their eyes or get uh, frustrated or flustered because what they said isn't what I heard, then that's on them. And we can have that conversation about, hey, hey, it's up to the speaker to make sure that the listener understands. It's not up to the listener to try to navigate and decode what it is that the speaker is saying. And no matter how clear the speaker might think they're being, if the listener still doesn't get it, 
then the communication skills are lacking. Number six, cultivate a supportive network. We talked about this earlier when we were discussing our emotional resiliency. Network, network, network. American contingency exists to be your network. If you are finding yourself at a high level of stress and anxiety about what might happen in the future, one, realize you have very little control over any of that stuff. What's going to happen when the hurricane comes or whenever a politician drives our country into a ball of flames, right? What is it you can really do about that? Because so many of those things are distant, they're off in the future, or they're existing in a city thousands of miles away. Building a supportive network in your local community. Some places and people that you can call upon when you need help. We all need help sometimes. There's a saying, and I'm pretty sure it goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go farther, go together. Number seven, regularly engage in reflective practice. I want you to take time to reflect on your experiences. Take time to reflect on 2023. Reflective practices could be journaling. It could be meditating. It could be therapy. It could be a lot of different things. But what are you doing to reflect? Maybe sit down with your spouse with a pen and a pad and write down the things around your careers, around your self-growth, around your relationships that you think you did well. And then reflect upon the things that you would like to work on. Look around your house and say, is there anything that you've been meaning to fix up that you've been putting off? Is there anything that you'd like to organize that you just can't seem to find the time for? Process these events. Learn from them. Apply these lessons to future challenges. I'm one of those people, it's like the girlfriend will be like, hey, there's an issue with the doorknob. And I put it on the list. And then whenever we're sitting there and we're chit-chatting and we're talking or I've got some time while you know I'm watching a little late night TV before I go to bed, I just go out and grab the box of screws and the drills and I just fix the doorknob. I mean, this doorknob thing literally took like two and a half minutes, right? I'm just not going to sit there and let this doorknob jiggle for the next two months simply because I didn't want to take two and a half minutes to fix it. That's ridiculous. I'm not, that's not the kind of person I am. Now, when we're talking about pulling up all of our grass and laying out new dirt so we stop getting flooding, that's going to take a little bit more time. But we can reflect upon what it is we seek to achieve and what we have achieved and start noticing what we can start to work a little bit more diligently. Simply saying, I don't have the time for that and pushing it off or trying to find somebody else to do it for us. Because yes, we might have the financial resources to pay somebody else. But if it's within my ability and my time management to do it on my own, I would rather learn that new skill. I'd never taken a doorknob off and fixed it and put it back on. But it was really cool to learn how to do that. And I didn't even have to go to YouTube for it. So psychological resiliency is developing self-awareness, practicing self-compassion, setting realistic goals and expectations, embracing learning and a growth mindset, enhancing our communication skills, cultivating a supporting network, and regularly engaging in reflective practices. When you take the topics that I have just discussed with you and you move them forward into your 2024, you utilize them to reflect upon your 2023. You can put yourself in the driver's seat of your life. Do not be the object of your life. Be the subject in your life. Do it for the plot. Expand yourself beyond what you think you are capable of. Because we are humans. We are capable of so much more than we give ourselves credit for. And we're also Americans. We have a historical reference and frame for which we can draw upon that shows that when we put our minds to something, we accomplish things. There are historical records of people dragging their butts all across the the United States to get out to the mystical land of the West in order to find a better life for themselves. And they had to face hardships and adversities and enemies along the way. And they did it with like wood tires and wood axles on wood carriages being pulled by horses (laughs) with no trails. There were no highways. (laughs) It was them pushing forward. We have that in us. Let's use it. Let's enhance ourselves by uniting. Let's galvanize toward a collective idea that when we are together, we go farther. Our historical records prove it. It's time that we start acting it. We prepare 
to respond and recover from any man-made or natural disaster because we know that when we put our minds to something, we achieve more. When you're ready to build the skills and network and confidence to be ready for whatever comes next, join us at AmericanContingency.com. Make that a reality right now, today. Go to AmericanContingency.com and be a part of this nationwide network that exists to serve you and for you to help serve back. Contribute. Be a part of something greater than yourselves. I guarantee you it'll make you so much better in your actual day-to-day life just because you will feel the power of the collectivity. All right, my friends, I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.